doesn't matter. So okay. <laughs> what, we're, what we're doing today is we, we are going directly into it without any introductions. You know the brief already. You know Denis Petrovicic and Makram Hani. And today we'll start talking about why does a currency peg fail? And we'll be talking about every currency peg, be it a, um, be it a currency peg, which is uh, a, 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 um, um, a cryptocurrency peg, or be it any other fiat currency peg. Why does a currency peg fail, Dennis, or some of the reasons? Oh, um, I think, that, well, that's a definitely hard question. Um, I, I want to, you know, hear your answer to it. <laughs> okay. um, I think a currency peg fails because nobody wants to, um, you know, it starts not providing what people expect of it. So if they expect stability, um, then they believe in that currency. Um, as soon as they feel that what they can purchase with that currency um, is less and less, they start, start using another currency and that kind of uh, starts uh, fading the process. So let's failure. let's go yeah. back to history and look at, at what creates a currency peg or what is a currency usually I mean, pegged I, to. I come from. I was born in Yugoslavia. It was okay. still Yugoslavia, and then it, okay. it split in ninety two. Okay. Um, and we went through. I mean, I was just a kid, but we went through like hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. Like that was literally um, every day you would not be able to buy anything with what you would have. And people okay. were fleeing to the Deutsche Mark. Okay. And that was just causing the spiral to go even parabolic, even more so. Um, and then, you know, people start stop trusting in the government that is kind of backing that currency. And, and you know, things start going slowly out of hands. But I think there's many cases of okay. such yeah. things happening in, the, in, in history. 100% and it's not only hyperinflation, it's devaluation of the currency value and some of it is trust. And why is it trust? It's trust because usually it's not backed by an asset. So currencies used to be backed by gold. Historically, they used to be even gold. Yeah. And then they used to be backed by gold until one day they stopped. And we, we, we had the currency depegged from gold as an underlying asset. And then the currency started being, uh, the US dollar uh, actually started becoming backed by a federal promise. So it's all built on sentiment and trust in the federal authority. Now, many countries peg their currency to the dollar and there's many valu uh, valuable uh, benefits for that. Some of the valuable benefits are countries do get stability of economy, stability of uh, purchasing power, and this allows a, a country to thrive easier. There's other ways and things that do happen when, 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 when you peg a currency to, a, uh, to a, a currency, to another currency like dollar, so a smaller country's or a weaker country's currency to a strong um, uh, uh, other fiat currency, what you get is you get the ease of relationships with that country, country on an economic level, where that ease of relationships allows you um, in and out of trades or selling goods to that country with a kind of stability on the costs at least. Cool. Now, how do you create stability beyond that? Usually you peg a currency to either a um, another currency or a bag of currencies, like I'll, I'll mention a country like Kuwait used to have their currency pegged to the dollar. Obviously, Kuwait produces so much oil and sells so much oil. A few, a few years ago, they decided that the currency should be backed by a bag of currencies. So they have now euro in it, they have dollar in it, they have probably renminbi in it. I'm not sure what's the bag exactly. Remember, guys, I'm not an economist, neither is Dennis. So, with Macron, time... Have you... Have you, by the way, researched how much it costs to um, to keep peg? Yeah, you know, I know. How much I know how much it costs to, to keep spend? peg in or to use to keep peg in my country. Uh, I come back originally from Lebanon, and in Lebanon, uh, the peg cost us at year, some years a hundred, hundred forty million dollars a year just to keep that peg. Okay, because of the fluctuation of trust and sentiment. And in some countries, it costs much more. Lebanon is a small country with small economy in general and a small GDP. What I want to tell you, however, when a cryptocurrency is pegged 
to a uh, dollar or to a fiat currency, I want to know the benefit of yours to hold it. Is there a benefit? Do you see a benefit of holding? Would you hold a cryptocurrency, a stable coin that's backed by a fiat currency or that's pegged to a fiat currency? I, I certainly see a benefit in this. Can you tell me what's the benefits? So if I have uh, money in the bank, most countries insure my holdings up to 100K, okay. which most people actually, it's fine. Uh, but for some people, it's not enough. So mm -hmm. they either need to have multiple bank accounts in different countries, uh, you know, it becomes complicated, you okay. know. Um, and when you hold it in the form of a token, you don't need that guarantee. Of course, the system backing it needs to provide that guarantee. Otherwise, Good. you know, but even national currencies can fail. So um, it's not the same. Um, it's not about a currency failing and you get insured up to 100K. It's the bank actually failing and it insures you up to 100K. So there's the risk of holding your money in a bank that might fail. That's why um, you generally buy course, property rather than hold currency, isn't it? A bank fail right for the banking uh, system sorry and yeah. that's generally why you buy property rather than hold currency yeah yeah in indeed. general but because why would you the asset but why would you hold so a stable what? coin that is pegged to the dollar that is not 100 percent backed by the dollar and obviously economically it's very difficult to back a stable coin 100 percent by the dollar so to have an equivalent dollar to dollar value for a stable coin so yeah, is it is it I, I heard things sorry I heard things from people yeah. saying that saying that I keep it there because the US dollar is affected by inflation if it's pegged to the dollar obviously it's affected the same way by inflation sorry you were saying something yeah. Dennis Well there's a, there there's certain things you can do with a tokenized dollar whatever you know whatever is backing it it's a tokenized dollar right if it's die, it's a tokenized dollar. It start, you know, wants to keep the value pegged one to one to the dollar. But if you take into account die as as is, if the dollar fails, die will not necessarily failing. It just needs to create uh, use peg. another fiat currency um, as a peg. Let's say it would use the Swiss franc, um, and that's it. You have ether valued in Swiss francs, and then you know they just use oracles and you know the de denomination of one die might be x amount of you know at a certain conversion rate obviously probably it's not as easy as it sounds right now but yeah we don't want to overcomplicate it, it either in that way yeah you know? we don't we don't want to overcomplicate yeah. it either however that doesn't work that way because the economics behind it, uh, it it cannot make it work that way if if that is true it means that what you're saying in a way or another is that DAI or any other stable coin is backed dollar to dollar. No, it's backed by ETH. Perfect. ETH and that's has saying value denominated in dollars, in Swiss francs, in euros, in whatever, you know. Perfect. Um, and if one currency fails, there's other currencies, fiat currencies that will kind of uh, not be failing. And the only thing that would happen is the exchange rate between ETH and the US dollar, for instance, would be becoming Perfect. more and more strange. So without complicating it, we'll move to the other parts of the same subject, but we will say one thing here. If it's backed by ETH and stability is derived from holding ETH as a backing, if ETH fluctuates, this stability can move. If they have it backed by ETH at a value of ETH at $3,500 and ETH becomes $1,500, obviously it stopped being backed one to one. Now, obviously, if they've backed it by ETH at $600 and ETH is valued at $2,000 today. No, because it doesn't work that way, Makram. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Why? But Tell me. DAI is actually um, uh, your position, is, is the position of collateralized loans um, and you know, it needs to be brought back to the system. Exactly. If you default on your loan, your ETH gets liquidated. And um, uh, actors that are called keepers are basically then uh, engaging in an auction to purchase that liquidated ETH. Um, so 
the system gets its value back. And if if and ETH if, holds value. If the, the price of ETH is declining, sorry, I need to continue here. If it's declining, what's happening is that those liquidations um, are, are happening because the collateral has not been updated. You would need to put more ETH in your position to secure it. So whenever the price of ETH is falling, there's an incentive for people who have loans outstanding to put more collateral in. So this kind of stabilizes the system in a decentralized manner. And I'm not saying that MakerDAO cannot fail. I'm just saying that so far it seems to be doing really well. And, you know, it's good we have it. Yes. And I, I agree with you on that side. However, whenever you have um, margin calls and those margin calls um, are held and you have collateral uh, that is, for example, one and a half times the value of the DAI, if we take DAI uh, as, as, a, as a total value, as a total market cap. And uh, this is so stressed by uh, the market movement, then it may go into trouble. And this has been proven by UST and what happened with UST, isn't it? Or you disagree I mean, on that? It's obvious. It's obvious that now all stable coins are going to be put to discussion. Okay. Everybody is going to be like the the um, opinion make uh, the opinion makers of stable coins. You know, everybody's going to talk. We are talking about it, right? Sure. It's become a very interesting theme for you as well. Exactly. Uh, which before it was like, oh, okay, they're stable coins. That's fine. But once one stable coin fails. Um, the interesting thing um, on the crypto market, uh, following it since several years, is that we've always talked about USDT. As you know, if USDT is proven to fail, the crypto mar market is going to default, basically, or something, okay. because there's so much kind of uh, reliance on USDT because it was the first um, uh, larger. Uh, stable coin out there and it still is um, and and now we got Luna and USDT uh, UST um, uh, failing kind of almost instead of e uh, uh, USDT instead of Tether um, and um, I think in one way it's good that Luna failed and not USDT because that's that would be a way larger uh, problem to deal with. Now, why is this subject interesting to me? Because I believe every token I would buy should be backed by either an asset or a project. Do you own NFTs? Um, no. no, no, I don't. Why? No, um, because I honestly, I started following it more when, I mean, I, I first uh, saw CryptoKitties. I'm not sure if you're familiar with CryptoKitties, but it was some time ago. It was before all the apes, you know. Uh, they really pioneered this. Um, and it seemed cool. Um, then, um, then it was all about this art, kind of, uh, JPEGs uh, being tokenized. And it, it didn't really appeal to me because I do love art, but I love uh, art on, you know, in my apartment or, you know, on the wall, um, me in the evening sipping wine with my wife. Hopefully kids are asleep, which usually um, are, except our youngest, and she's awake till midnight. So it's really frustrating to get up at six in the morning. Um, anyways. Yeah, NFTs. Here is How telling about us, by the How way. About you? NFTs for you? Do you have like a big collection of NFTs? None and never. And I'll tell you why in a second. But Kieran is telling us, Kieran, how are you? Kieran Mesquita uh, okay. is saying, yo, yo, guys, DAI is backed by ETH market liquidity, not by ETH itself. Okay. Okay. So uh, I believe it, it, it lands in the same think for me at least i understand guys for you it may mean mean something different for me it lands in the same place where it lands is i don't own nfts today because i believe any token non-fungible or fungible uh, or fungible token has a um 
utility and has a use. And as long as I don't see it used the right way, um, I wouldn't buy it. So in other words, if I buy a token, I want to buy a token that is either backed by a project or by, backed by, by an asset. So I'll give you an example. I would buy BST, it's backed by a project. If I like the technology, the project, and the mission, and the, the roadmap, then I would buy that token. But if you show me a, a token that is backed by a thought of an individual that it can become a future currency, I'm not your customer. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm not saying a stable coin is good or bad. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. I'm saying I'm not your buyer. I'm not an interested customer in something that's not backed by either a project or an asset. So if you tell me what is the best use for an NFT, I tell you there's plenty of uses. It can hold records for car ownership. It can hold records for property. It can hold, it, there's too many uh, utility and utilizations for that technology. I don't believe that being part of a club, if I wanna be part of a club, I will join Rotary. I, if I, I don't believe that being part of a club creates that value of 30 ETH for me or whatever it is. With all respect to all the clubs in the world, and I do understand the value in the network, I probably like to create and preserve my network in a different way. So that's why I don't buy NFTs currently. And this gets me to the main subject and my main interest in any coin or any project or any token, stable or not. I want it to be backed by a project or I want it to be backed by an asset. Is it the same to you, Dennis, right. or no? Because usually on this or those subjects, we have a totally, totally different yeah. opinion. Yeah, I come from a Pluto, you come from a different, different planet on that. Well, no, I, I think it's more likely, I would say. I, I bought tokens backed by nothing, really, as well, um, just for the heck of it, you know. Um, it seemed like a a fun community to to watch in a yeah. way through the tweets. I don't engage much because I don't really um, um, have that luxury of time uh, because I'm building uh, with you uh, and and the team this thing called Block Square and Ocean Point. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't necessarily see an asset as a traditional asset. An asset might be as well uh, a network for somebody. There's a lot of people who uh, spend a lot of time online and I think the NFT um, uh, kind of craze just popped at the right time where people were even more so online. They were alone at home maybe, you know, they didn't spend a lot of time with others socializing because of COVID and I think that was also kind of con combined the situation because you always need timing for a new tech to emerge. You know, uh, for real estate tokenization, we need to have a mortgage crisis or something, which we don't want to have, but maybe something that triggers the thought of, in people of, hey, what if we um, uh, go and use something else? Um, so here it was, NFTs um, creating communities that are kind of uh, special to those part of that community. Um, and, uh, and I think that might be turned into an asset by somebody who is um, who is part of it and, and knows how to do it. But most most people will not turn being part of that community into an asset for themselves, but just rather be part of a network that represents an asset for somebody else. So you would buy it and you would get into that that way? I I might, but I didn't. Never. Okay. So okay. and it didn't attract me that much because I have a different network that doesn't need an NFT for me to get in touch with that person. Uh, uh, the NFTs I see is, are, are hidden here. You know, it, it's to per people's minds. And, you know, if, if it's a person that has a similar, not view, but not, doesn't need to be a similar view, but it has um, a, a deeper insight or a broader view into the world, I, you know, that's my club. Perfect. So we, we are different in that. We are different in that approach. But here there's a few very interesting questions. Before I go back to Kieran's explanation about UST, um, 
I'll start by Chris Zima, which is the last question. Why not peg token to property asset and create a new stable coin? Actually, there is one that's backed by a property asset. Which one is it? Dennis. Well, none, none as of yet, but this is what we're building. We're, we're building um, Ocean Point in a manner of, uh, of emitting points based on, on the value of, of held tokenized assets, real estate assets, um, so, and have it repeat. So, you know, um, if we have tokenized and locked into Ocean Point 10 million um, uh, tokenized assets, real estate assets, we would have a market cap of 10 million for that four points. So actually, yeah. Chris, well, there is one that's coming up, okay, and will be backed by uh, real estate. And um, if you if you want more details on that, you definitely can join our Discord or our Telegram, and you will get much more detail on that. But there is one coming up. So um, so there is a stable coin for me at the end of the day, or for people like me who want it backed by an asset, and by an asset that creates cash flow. Because for me, most important is the cash flow that an asset can generate. And this discussion I had probably 10 times only today, I had that 10 times. Why would I buy, it's gold or property. This was the question that was sent to me. And to me, I would never buy gold, but remember I have a bias to property against, uh, but not against anything else. It's a bias to property. And when I look at gold, gold does not have intrinsic value to me. Uh, what have intrinsic value is a cow that gives you milk. The problem with a cow is that you kill it and it's gone. Uh, you eat the meat, it's gone. I prefer a cow that gives me milk and continues producing and I can sell the milk at the dollar value tomorrow. That's property. Okay, so that's my cow and that produces forever. <laughs> I go here to uh, Rakshit uh, Shetty with how does the tax filing works in decentralized finance? Can I refer him to the session with Daniel Gomez? Oh, for sure. Perfect. Um, so, Rakshid, I think that that's the one. There is a session there on this channel. Um, it's if I'm not mistaken, it's session six. Please, if if it's not six, don't shoot me. It can be five. It can be seven. With an amazing gentleman called Daniel Gomez explaining everything taxation and um, on for DeFi and for uh, for uh, blockchain in general. Um, I go back here to Kieran before we move to something else and see if there's any other questions on, on Twitter as well. Kieran says, UST had anchor protocol, which inflated the supply of UST faster than sustainable, not by purchasing, which adds collateral and liquidity into the system or taking uh, market positions. So obviously in a way or other, there was an issue with the protocol or in other words, the algorithm maybe, yeah? This is what Kiran is trying to tell us. Yeah, so um, it's like you want to grow faster than you should, right? Um, in a way. So I think like building up Ocean Point will, will have a very similar problem. Um, people want to have it grow faster, but we won't be able to grow it faster. Um, the beauty of a stablecoin is that I don't think you need a huge market cap for it to provide utility to a certain portion of, of the market. Um, and uh, there's, I mean, the, there's, there's several um, research papers on, on, this, uh, on this topic. Um, but it, it would be like we want to... Um, grow ocean point and we have this market demand on on the stable coin but we're not able to onboard real estate assets as quickly as the market would want to consume the stable coin and now we would create let's say a a game on ocean point a pool where magically that pool would mint points into circulation and then slowly slowly the the um, assets backing that stable coin um, the ratio becomes... What Dennis um, is saying, you know, this is what would have happened if we would allow it, but we will not allow it. Will we allow it, Dennis? Definitely no, not. No. no. Kieran is saying here, um, <laughs> this is the biggest advantage of Ocean Point. Most algo stable coins that have had these collapses 
have been trying to generate cash flow through inflationary means, which will always collapse. Yes. Thank you, Kieran. He By the way, guys, it. he nailed it. <laughs> he nailed it. And for everyone listening, you you uh, you made my day, Kieran, because um, again, uh, to me, a coin, anything should be backed by a project or should be backed by tech or should be backed by an asset unless it's backed by a government and no one here tells me so that you trust the government more um we live within that system currently and until that system collapses which seems to be coming very soon if we continue this way um <laughs> until the system collapses yes i do trust uh, the uh, the system uh, to a certain limit so um without without going so far away from our uh, subject here you you uh, look at the scene today and you look at cryptocurrency collapsing and uh, or some cryptocurrencies value at least wise collapsing uh, there's talks about the recession um if we if what if what i envisioned a few years ago and continue to see happens it means that we're going to stagflation. Now, many people are talking about inflation and many others are talking about stagnation. So probably stagflation is what would come. Regardless if Goldman Sachs chief says it's a 30% possibility of a recession within the coming two years or anyone else says anything different. It seems that this is where we're going. And it seems within that drought of liquidity happens. This affects mortgages. Um, this affects the whole ecosystem. This affects people's ability to buy houses. There will be less cash in the system. So all of those will be happening. And there, it's not like we're timing the market. We're telling you what we're, we're predicting the future. It's only logical, guys, that this will come. Nobody knows when. It may come in a year. It may come in five. I expect that it will come between one and three. But again, I'm not timing the market. I'm, I'm living the logic that it that uh, derives from the facts in front of me. However, within all of that, um, we are building something at Block Square here and Ocean Point that would probably be able to live that test. And not only live that test, but add value when no, no other value is on the table. Isn't it? Um, yeah, we'll see how, how things go. I always like to be more cautious than not, because um, you cannot really predict. Usually when the economy goes down, the morale of people goes down. Um, they, at the same time, they, they, there's a, a trench of people who keep being open to new possibilities. Um, and, um, and new stuff emerges out of it. So as a species, we were being able to kind of evolve from crisis to crisis and the cycles uh, are shorter and shorter because we're living faster. Um, now, will Ocean Point be able to survive that? If we do it right, I think yes, but there's chances of doing it wrong as well. So, you know, uh, I like to invite all the smart people around us to, to reach out and, um, you know, start providing their expertise on it. I mean, we're building out something that we hope we can be proud of saying that it's a DAO in time. And as I read on Twitter by um, an Ethereum uh, uh, guy, he said, look, you don't need to start a DAO by being fully decentralized uh, and fully autonomous is not going to happen. It's perfectly fine to start a DAO, a very centralized structure, like kind of like we're starting in a way. Um, but you need to keep it organized. Yeah, actually, so, uh, Akeem, whatever Akeem, you, do, you know, just don't sacrifice the organization part of it. it Akeem doesn't need talked to be about like that, Texas. yeah. Akeem yeah. talked about letting go control, but not letting go control faster than needed and more than needed, because then everything will collapse for everyone who's trying to get control. So do it gradually with time, which is exactly what we're doing. And I believe we're doing a good job at it. Yeah, to date. I think it's like uh, Ahim was talking about, about his experience or our experience, but he's re provided very a lot, uh, a, a lot, very a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot to to the building up of Fibri from from uh, basically eight, eight people into a network of, of hundreds of people involved, um, and 
and even at this level, it needs a centralized kind of governance body that steers the initiatives forward because it takes devotion and time uh, and effort uh, by, uh, by the people running it. For instance, I've been involved a lot, but lately I've not been able to provide uh, that much time for Fibery um, because of all the things that we're doing here. Um, and if you start by starting decentralized at the beginning, everybody's looking at everybody else on their opinion. Nobody's leading um, and the wrong leaders might emerge even. So it might be, you know, people who are kind of strong forcing themselves to become the voice or the leaders of, of the, the organization. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean they have the best interest um, uh, as hard. Yeah. So um, we are, again, we are onto something that may be there when a traditional and conventional means aren't. Let me explain it my way. Today, a bank lends you, in general, it's known, lends you when you don't need the money. Isn't it? And when you need the money, most of the time, the bank will not be able to lend you. That's why they say uh, a bank uh, lending is similar to them giving you an umbrella when it's not raining. And when it starts raining, they need their umbrellas back. Now, when it's decentralized and when you have a um, decentralized system where you are able to uh, create that value from the um, from the collateral, uh, sorry, collective rather than collateral, collective input of plenty of people, thousands of people, then, and that's DeFi, you are able uh, with time to create value even when there is drought of liquidity in the system. Because as I always say, your neighbor who is a tailor and his neighbor who sells vegetables will continue to sell vegetables and will continue to be tailors and care about their future of their kids and, and the future of uh, uh, the, the universities of their kids and health of their kids at all times, including investments that relate to the future of their kids. So although the economy may be suffering at the time, although there will really be drought of cash, there is still value there within the details of the economy. And this will, in a way or another, channel itself whenever it's coming from that collective effort and collective impact into a system that can pass this value on to you as an asset owner, as a property owner. And this is of much value. So that's why I see that DeFi in real estate has so much value. Now, you've, you've created a graphic today and uh, we were discussing it in the middle of the day. Do you want us to talk about it? Well, I don't know. Because I, I found it very, want... very interesting. Yeah. Okay. We, All we, right. we, without, without showing a graphic, without doing anything, what, no, no. What, what is created, guys, is the following. If you have a, 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 a pool of 250,000 tokens that are distributed every month today, uh, as and, and and you have a 25 million uh, dollars of real estate locked in and then we stake 10 percent of that which is 2.5 million of real estate uh, thus each uh, person owning a property of five hundred thousand dollars will have would have staked fifty thousand dollars isn't it I mean, this came from the conversations we had uh, with our advisory board Andre. Um, suggested that, you know, can we do like a simple calculation um, so that we can take people um, to the numbers? You know, you're talking with an asset owner, they're like, okay, this seems cool. Yeah, sure, I'll do it. Um, but how much could I stand to make? It's hard to say because BSD can have a value of zero, obviously. Um, but uh, what we can talk about is the amount of BST that you can earn as an asset owner. And what you um, um, said is basically at the current level of assets we uh, have in our tokenization oven, which is about 25 million uh, worth of uh, US dollars worth of real estate assets. 
and every, every one of those owners are just going to stake 10% of their assets value. Why 10%? Because in real estate, there's no way you're buying real estate without putting 10% of your equity in. Like there's no bank that's going to finance that. So 10% is, feels like a very safe, um, uh, usually it's like 20, maybe even 25% or, or more. So it, everybody who owns real estate owns at least 10% of equity. So that's why we're using 10% um, as a benchmark and just to not complicate and put everybody at the same kind of level, playing field. Um, and, um, and so if you're today staking 10% um, of a half a million worth um, apartment in Dubai, for instance, um, you are staking, you're going to stake something valued at around 50K, which would give you in the current uh, amount of assets, we have about 2% of, of the pool share. And um, which the, is 5,000 BSTs, works, yeah? It's just around 5,000 BST. But obviously this is going to change with version 03. We're going to start a liquidity mining campaign to bring more value um, to BST itself. And that's then the rewards are going to be shifted and directed to, to that pool instead of um, the asset pool and the governance pool, which are going to only have 25% each. So that's 125,000 per month. Um, and that might get diluted even more. So at that moment, you're just gonna basically earn uh, what a quarter of this if the amount of assets would double in that time, which I think is a feasible uh, feasible goal to get to something like 50 million worth of real estate uh, between version 02 and version 03. But here, there's yeah. two things. First, probably the value of the token will be at higher at that time. But the very important thing today is what I want to talk about now. 5,000 BSTs is what you get if you take this calculation forward at a 0.2 price level, which today BST is higher than 0.2, but let's take 0.2 just for to be very conservative. That's approximately $1,000 a month. Now, that's annualized $12,000 if it was an annual return. $12,000 of the 50 thousand dollars is 24 percent so you're getting 24 percent on the staked value as an additional profit today so that's additional revenue because you're not sharing the revenue that currently derives from your property so your property revenue you're keeping now afterwards you're still sharing your or you start sharing your property revenue but still let's say you get half of that or even quarter of that. And let's say the BST value is still the same. That's still 6% if it's a quarter of that. 6% return on your staked value. And that's, that's a side off that you got in general at that time. Your, your value uh, back into your pocket. Yeah, so imagine making today 24% additional to what you're making. Whatever your property is making, probably 5, 6, or 10% ROE. Now, if you have a mortgage of 25, uh, of 75% on, on the property, today, that value added to your current ROE, probably you'll end up with something like 35 or 40%. That's a huge, guys. So I would tell you, <laughs> you know what? go on today and try to get your property tokenized it's an opportunity in my view you're not paying a penny to tokenize your property today and you have a period of uh, trial you're trying the system trying if you like the returns and i'm sure you will and then uh, at the same time you're rewarded to because you're a pioneer and you're trying this before others and before anyone else in the world so that we can build our ecosystem and that reward is going to you to build our ecosystem into something more dynamic yes dennis here's one thing that we need to mention because it also impacts the, the economy of token holders right uh, some might be afraid of you know okay this property people you're gonna tokenize their, you know, you're gonna spend money on token and time on tokenizing their assets. You're gonna bring those assets on chain, 
you're going to provide them to our BST, you know, and then after six months, they, what, uh, withdraw the, their rewards and then they, they dump it on the market and it's, you know, bygones and we don't care about it. Um, it this is not going to happen. Um, the reason is that after the six months, yes, they can keep on staking, um, you know, probably the rewards are going to be diminished to that pool um, in due time. And that's up to, you know, us to govern as a community. Um, but what's going to happen is once they click that withdrawal from the contract, the, um, the, they get the asset tokens back. So, you know, they're free to do with their asset, whatever they please. Um, but uh, the actual reward, the BST, is going into a vesting contract. Um, and the vesting is um, 24 months, so that's two years. Um, why we want to not only protect the community with this, but as well the asset owner themselves, because they might be premature um, to judge uh, what to do with BST at that moment. Um, and if we do things right, if we kind of grow the amount of assets uh, added to the system, um, and we take this, I'll use the word slowly um, and cautiously, I think we have a chance of building up something that might even pay mortgages for the people who staked, um, or at least a part of it, or maybe a utility bill. Why not? So today, how much assets have we, have we tokenized already? So... Um, you know, it, it's 35 assets. Um, How many cities? The last time I checked. Sorry? How many cities? I don't or know countries. The city, Forget about I know cities. The countries. countries. I, know the, I think it's seven countries. I, I think we okay. tokenized just recently. Um, the last deals were in Canada. Um, and then we have going back Turkey, um, Germany, <clears throat> um, Austria. We have uh, the Emirates and Slo Slovenia and Belgium. And I'm missing something, or maybe I'm not counting with my, with my hands properly. So I believe we hit seven, <laughs> seven countries, guys, 35 assets, around $28 million. Uh, sorry, 20, 24. 24 million 24, dollars? 24 million, yeah. 24 million dollars of assets tokenized already there's others in the yeah. pipeline guys and, and there's seven... this question you know the question is uh you know is it only assets held by a company or can you do it with with an individual, individual. and we can do both we can do both because we found this way if you're a natural owner you can get a company to host the the resolution um and we can do that in in a limited amount of jurisdictions for now because we need to have food on the ground or a partner or a reliable partner in that country um but as well it's uh, also possible for the owner themselves to establish um a, a sole proprietary company that is in most jurisdictions it's possible to open it for free you just uh, you just go to the uh, to the appropriate office and you open it up, and then that legal entity can actually sign the corporate resolution while the owner, which is the same person, owner of the asset, um, signs uh, an addendum to their uh, corporate resolution. So um, essentially, the position is. If I'm holding tokens of Macron's property, um, who he holds in in his own name. Um, I can sue both his uh, the the company um, that he owns and and uh, and Markram directly, uh, which is not something that uh, feels advisable. comfortable. <laughs> not, not, not I, I don't th I don't think. But um, what happens is that the amount tokenized is so small, and right now what we're not doing is we're not allowing Markram to sell tokens to me. I I'm not getting exposed to that. But the only uh, entity that Markram will be able to sell tokens to is going to be Ocean Point. And Ocean Point has a way more advanced interest in suing Markram <laughs> and going and, and, and creating a good relationship without uh, legal action <laughs> with him. So uh, 
the so the end result on. is yeah. guys will all yeah. end up suing macram so uh, <laughs> um before before i i close here um because we tried to make the session shorter guys and we tried to yeah. make it faster and we tried to make it richer and hopefully we achieved that we 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 are we actually, in the beginning, I just noticed we were so aggressive even doing that, or I was so aggressive doing that. But let's see, let's see the reaction of people around us. Nobody knows what's right, what's wrong. Um, uh, um, something here that Kiram mentioned, which I will, from my side, end with. Um, do you have anything, Dennis, that you would like to tell our community or anyone watching now before I tell you what Kiran said, and then we take it forward from there? Okay, don't do macro. Don't sue Macron. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't sue Macron. So, guys, um, Kiran said the following, and I, I, I loved what he said. That's why I left it till the, till the end. Um, being able to generate cash flows through um, externalities eliminates the biggest risk to peg collapse while fulfilling the largest demand from stablecoin holders. The summary of all of this statement, guys, is cash flow. So real estate is all about cash flow. What we're building here is around real estate. The tech is important. By the way, in a chat with Simon this morning, um, the, the tech is important, but what he talked about is how much legal work has gone behind the system. Over the past few years, how much, how much buildup in things that people don't see that, that has been built that the paper that, that that trail that have happened to get to here uh, and to get it wasn't paperless guys it was full of so much legal work hard work to make sure that things work and get them tested tested and 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 uh, and and really tested again and again and again so um i believe that you need to try what we have uh we're not telling you subscribe to anything we're telling you try something that will earn you an additional return for the coming few months and after those few months you can decide if you want to move on in one of the four ways that we talked about uh, two sessions ago and i advise you to go back and watch one of those sessions and because it will tell you everything about uh, tokenization today and the process in detail Dennis, do you have the, any word? And I think we're gonna um, drop the the deck uh, in our Discord. Uh, everybody can take a look, uh, give p feedback. Um, maybe we can make it better, um, and anybody can use it um, to con convince themselves and their neighbor to tokenize their home. Any other word, Dennis, to our community? No, thank you. That's it. Just. For, for being awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, guys. Two things I want to tell you before we go today. One is give us feedback, please. We, we changed the setup today slightly because of your feedback. Uh, we had great feedback and, and this helps us maybe make it faster, maybe make it slower, maybe make it um, uh, talk about different subjects. We want to do something that does add value to you because that adds value to us as well. Uh, we, we have fun doing this and we enjoy doing this and we'll continue having fun doing this, adding value to everyone around us. Now, um, uh, the, the, um, the things that we want to close by is first, I want to thank members of our community who are really, really engaging. There is a gentleman a few days ago, a few weeks ago, that uh, is a member of the community, had a meeting with Dennis and actually he connected with Dennis through Discord or Telegram. Telegram, I Telegram. Think. And, and jumped on and said, you know what, guys, I want to give you my view on the risk uh, assessment of, of how things are being done and what things are. And, and so thankful to on someone. The, uh, who the onboarding process of assets, essentially. Exactly. And, yeah. and that's so appreciated, I believe. And, and, and we so started the conversation, a thread, an email thread, um, and put our inputs from different perspectives uh, on the same manner. And, and things are, I think, um, we'll move on from there. 100%. So thank you. Thank you all for being with us today. I want to tell you next week, definitely don't miss it. 
you'll have better than our faces. You'll have a gentleman who was 11 years old. I'll not tell you his name today. It will be kept a non-secret on YouTube only if you go to the channel and check next week session. It's a gentleman who was 11 when he read the Bitcoin white paper. You tell me how did it fall to his hands? Yeah, his father left it on the couch. Not really. He was on the first blockchain newsletter, okay, or mailing list. It wasn't a newsletter, sorry. It was a mailing list. He was 11. It was 2009, guys. My son is seven. We feed his turtle. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us on The Brief today. God bless you. Join us next week. Have fun. <laughs> See you then. <laughs>